Good day, citizens, and welcome to this week's podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And this episode this week is Franklin and Jefferson. I'm going to say this three times in the course of the next few minutes. February 25th, in Norfolk, the Roper Theater. I'm doing an evening of comedy. I'm going to be a stand-up oh, humanist. Right. A stand-up humanist. Uh, we're all waiting for the reviews on that. Fe- February 25th. <laughs> so I want people to come. The Roper Theater, February 25th, Norfolk, Virginia. A night of humanist comedy. That's never well, happened well, before. We'll have to talk, but perhaps we ought to... Uh, get you to relate a few jokes to uh, practice. I'll be here all week. Yeah. yeah. This was real fun this week. Um, and I say Benjamin in the show, Franklin. I thank you uh, uh, for recommending a, a book to me on Franklin, The First American by H.W. Brands, um, which is just a mammoth read, but worth every page. It is so thorough. The only criticism I might have is there's not much of our man Jefferson in the book. <laughs> that's, that's certain. And we didn't cover all of Jefferson's connections with Franklin in this program. So we should do a second one. But I'll tell you this. This came about because I ran into Ken Burns at an event in New York last spring, and he said, you know, I'm I'm doing a film on Franklin. Do you want to be part of it? And I said, yes. And so that tells you who I am because, (laughs) I I mean, if he had said I'm doing a program on economic differentials in Swahili. Do you want to be in it? Yes. Uh, yes. So so I said yes, and then I thought, "Uh uh uh-oh, uh-oh, because I don't – I don't know that much about Dr. Franklin, so I worked like a demon on this, and I'm so glad that I did because it, as well, you heard in the program, it changed a little bit the way I see Jefferson on the issue of slavery, but it also just filled me with joy about that such a man existed, that he played such an important role, and that he's so much more interesting than the public caricature of Dr. Franklin. We think of him with his kite and this kind of doddering old man who's falling asleep at meetings. And But this is not true. Well, where does that come from? Well, Franklin, and he's a little bit like Theodore Roosevelt. He helped to create his own caricature. You know, he, he wore his hair down and, and, and didn't wear wigs and he dressed plainly and he kind of dozed off or pretended to doze off at meetings. And he kind of played this this character and it kind of became – Rooted in American memory, but American he, mythology. He, he did so much, you know, in the in the formation of the of the nation, and all the you know these little things like we talk about the Franklin stove and bifocals, the lightning rod. Yeah, on and on and on. These, uh, these obvious, I can't see my hand in front of my face, but he could, and put these odd pieces together, and what is it, ameliorate. The condition, the condition of, of mankind. mankind. I love that phrase. Me the, too. The, like the heart of the Enlightenment. And Jefferson felt it, you know. So he was. He wrote that letter to Lafayette saying, "Okay, you got. You're 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 a nobleman. You only travel in very limited circles. You need to get out into the country and go into people's huts, and and sleep in their beds because you say you're you you, you need a little bit of rest. You must nap and look into their kettle and see what they've got to eat and and see if you can improve their lives. Because how can you be a leader of a country if you don't know how average people actually or poor people actually live their lives. You know, well, We've got to talk more about Franklin. Before we do, though, February 25th. February 25th. That's and totally I know you're skeptical. Number two. I know you're, two. you're skeptical. Uh-huh. But I'm going to be doing the stand-up comedy routine, including the famous pickle story that people have heard about in <laughs> Norfolk. People should fly from all over to be there. And I'm excited. It's also going to be a fundraiser for one of our flagship stations, WHRO, their sponsor. Hey, great segue. If you would like to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Aside from coming to the event on February 25th. Please go to jeffersonhour.com. And we so appreciate your support. But beyond that, too, and not to belabor the point, but we really are proud of that web page. And neither of us have much to do with its construction, but there's it's pretty deep. There's a lot of stuff there. And, and again, we get um, uh, regular requests f- uh, for uh, uh, ways to share your essays, and you can find all of that you at jeffersonhour.com. Speaking of that, you know, the, and support the, the Jefferson Watch essays um, are a kind of a nuisance in a way Why because that? they take time. But – I am, I, but stay with me. I am. I'm so proud of them. I'm so happy that I'm doing them. They give me a chance to <laughs> to express myself. 
and to and to try to process well, this you, world that we're in. You used to read a, write a newspaper column, which I know was you know you probably don't even want me to talk about this, but I know it was painful for you because it was a a fairly provincial uh, staff that would edit your work, and we know and talk in this show about the work. how painful it is to have that kind of. And I always encouraged you to. Think of a bigger audience, and you've got things to say, and that's what the Jefferson Hour essays are about. And I, I for one, applaud them and encourage you, and I would say 99% of the people who write in do the same, and that's enough of that. Benjamin Franklin, if you haven't read a biography of Franklin, do, and the one that we recommend most is H.W. Brand's um, the first American. You know, I think you can get. I, I think the ebook edition of that is like five bucks. No, it's, it's inexpensive. Yeah, and it's, so it's, yeah, it's worth it. And uh, it, it, you know, it's it, great. Book. You understand Jefferson a lot better when you understand Franklin. Even though he's out. not in the book, you understand the times better. So thanks, everyone, and happy Christmas. If we don't hear, you know, another way, be, happy. And and to our young friend Hayden. Hayden, sleep well, Hayden. No, no child should be subjected to this. <laughs> no adult. Really. Let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me, I am pleased to say, is President Thomas Jefferson, and good day to you, sir. Good day to you, citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I've taken the liberty of picking a a subject of conversation this week, and I, I hope you will agree to it. I was hoping I could get you to uh, perhaps reminisce and and remember a bit about Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, was in many respects the greatest American. He was one of the greatest men in the world. He was uh, a pure exemplar of the Enlightenment. He was a scientist of international reputation. Uh, he was a great statesman, uh, a beautiful writer and printer, a diplomat who changed the course of human history. Uh, he never served as the president of the United States. He was too old by the time the Constitution was ratified in 1788. Do you think he would have wanted the job, sir? He might have. You know, he did allow himself to become effectively the the governor or the president of the of Pennsylvania uh, when he returned from uh, Europe after his long sojourn there as, a, as an American representative and diplomat. He, he was not without some ambition, and he had a very strong sense of civic duty. Um, he had played a very important role in Pennsylvania colonial politics before um, the coming of the revolution. Uh, I, I can't say for certain. He was a humble man, and, and, he, and he wanted to dedicate the second half of his life to science and public service. So had we called upon him, as we did George Washington, to come out of retirement to serve as the first president of the United States— I think it's quite clear that Franklin might have been convinced, but he was he was too old. He was 37 years older than I was. He was 45 years older than James Madison, the father of the Constitution. I, I reckoned a, a generation was about 19 years. If that's the case, he was more than two generations older than James Madison. So he was elderly and, and not in good health by the time that the Constitutional Convention occurred, and, and nobody, I think, felt that he had enough vigor left to serve in an office like the presidency of the United States. But had he been 25 or so years younger, uh, no question. To make a comparison, not to um, step out of bounds, but to make a comparison between you and, and Mr. Franklin, you were both what were considered polymaths. He was really an expert in, for the time, electricity, meteorology, geology, linguistics, mathematics, literature, philosophy, and politics. And so were you, sir. I would not allow myself to be placed in the same category as Dr. Franklin. He, he was a much more serious scientist than I was. I was. I was fascinated by many things, but I'm really an amateur in the 18th century sense of that term, a lover of knowledge rather than a professional. Franklin uh, worked so assiduously in his experiments in electricity uh, that he was renowned in Europe before he really got there uh, to serve as uh, first an agent of the colony of uh, Pennsylvania and later uh, and other colonies and later as a representative of the Continental Congress uh, 
of the United States in absentia. He was elected to be a member of the Royal Society, which is the most prestigious intellectual organization in Great Britain. His science was uh, of great significance. You know, I, I don't know how quite to uh, to make it um, sensible to people of your era, but when he started out in the 1740s, working on electricity, electricity was a parlor game. It was a it was a trick. You know, what people did who understood a little bit would bring a glass rod and, and, and a piece of silk and they would rub it and create what's known as static electricity and pick up small pieces of paper or send shocks through a small audience of people. But it was seen as a as a kind of a clever parlor trick. Yeah, he saw it then for more than that, though. Well, well he was fascinated and, and he, he, he began his experiments – by meeting a man named Archibald Stewart in Boston who was doing just that, who was, who was entertaining people at, at parties, at house parties and in, in small conferences and so on. And Franklin was fascinated. He bought some of that equipment from Stewart and then he thought, well, it's one thing to be fascinated by this as, as one is, but let's see, A, what electricity really is. Is there a way to define it? to measure it, to understand its basic properties. What can we know about electricity, number one? Number two, what use can it be? Remember, this is a time when there were no electric lights. Electricity had not been channelized for any human purpose at this time. So he thought, can it help to cook food? Can it can it help people recover from illness? Can it stimulate people who say have had a stroke? Uh, can we can we channelize it so that we can prevent fires, lightning strikes on churches and public buildings and houses and so on? And as you know, in 1752 with his son William, he conducted his famous experiment with a kite and a key – uh, this A little bit of this had already been going on in France, but he was unaware of it at the time. And what he was trying to show in that famous kite experiment was that lightning is a form of electricity. Nobody really was certain of this at the time. And so he wanted to see, is, is lightning electrical in nature? And if so, what can we do with that knowledge? Of course, now we know just how dangerous that experiment was. In fact, I think there was a man, I believe, in Sweden who met his death conducting this experiment. Yes. It, it, Franklin was, was very clever. He used a, a piece of silk string to separate himself from the kite string. So that was an insulator. And by the way, it is Dr. Franklin who gave us the terms conductor and non-conductor. So he he showed us that some things will conduct electricity and other things will not. And of course, you want to separate yourself if you can. But but here's the important thing. The minute he, he proved that lightning is a form of electricity, he thought, well, then maybe if we put a metal rod on the roof of a building, a house or a, a church steeple, and ran a wire from that rod down to the ground, we could channelize the electricity in the air and make it dissipate, make it um, diffuse without burning down that building. And so he invented the lightning rod. For Franklin, knowledge was important, but application of knowledge for use to help human beings be safer, uh, live better, cook their food more quickly or more thoroughly, that mattered to him as much as any pure science ever did. So just on the basis of this, he invents the lightning rod. But here's the most important part of this story. He didn't patent this. He made no effort to monopolize this. He realized that a lightning rod can save buildings and possibly save lives. Therefore, the person who discovered it, in this case himself, should give it to humanity. It it, it belongs to civilization because it, it can improve life on earth. That was his. That was his motto. Well, Mr. Jefferson, that sounds like a philosophy that you yourself ad- adopted. Yes, we belong to the same intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment, and and you know, the essential mission of the Enlightenment was, and I'm going to quote here, was to ameliorate the condition of mankind, to ameliorate 
the condition of mankind. Mr. Franklin could have made uh, a great deal of profit off of, uh, say, a copyright of, of these uh, discoveries of his, as well as you, sir, in your design of uh, the Moldbore plow. Patenting and trademarking and copyright didn't really exist at the time, but he certainly could have done everything in his power to protect this industrial secret and to and to profit from it. But that wasn't that wasn't his philosophy of life, nor was it mine. And as you know later in my life, I said, he who takes an idea from me informs himself without disinforming me, just as he who lights his torch from my candle illuminates himself without darkening me. That the person who discovers an idea has literally uncovered it. That idea was there, waiting for someone who had leisure or ingenuity or good luck to come upon it. And the person who comes upon it now has a duty to humankind, if it's a good idea, to to spread it, to diffuse it as rapidly and as completely as possible with the least uh, self-interest. I think also of Mr. Franklin's, uh, well, we call it Franklin's stove or fireplace. It's the problem of heat loss, sir. So, so here again, this is Dr. Franklin. He was interested in what's known as convection. Why does hot air rise and, and cool air fall? This, of course, has a lot to do with rain and snow and, and hail and sleet. So he was interested in, in how air moves and what the temperature of air has to do with that and if this creates wind and so on and so forth. But then when he, when he, when he understood this, this, this phenomenon, his next question was, and what is the application to ameliorate the condition of mankind? And he thought 90% or more of the heat in a fireplace goes straight up the chimney, which is a waste of money and firewood. Uh, and it also means that houses are drafty and they don't heat very well. They, these are very inefficient machines. And so he thought, what could be done to transform the nature of burning firewood inside? To make it more efficient. To keep more of the heat in the house or the, or the building, to, to waste less and to save money. And so he developed, as you know, what's known as the Franklin stove. And that stove, the design of it, is still essentially being used in your time just as it was in his own time. In other words, it's hard to improve upon the Franklin stove, and it's it's in almost every primitive cabin that burns firewood inside, not using a, a, a fireplace or a standard chimney. So this is the kind of thing that he loved to do, to make life better for people by understanding the underlying phenomena of the universe. The author H.W. Brands wrote about Mr. Franklin, and he said, Franklin's genius generally consisted in observing commonplace phenomena and applying the principles behind them in a novel or productive way. Precisely. That's precisely the point that I'm making about Dr. Franklin, that he was interested in, in phenomena, generally. He was curious. He was a man of extraordinary curiosity all of his life, but his curiosity had application. And remember, when he created the American Philosophical Society in 1743, its mission statement said it was designed for useful knowledge. It was the pursuit of useful knowledge, not abstraction. Mr. Jefferson, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be back to this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And welcome back, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. We've been talking about uh, Dr. Franklin, who I find to be just a fascinating uh, gentleman. I, and, of course, you knew him. Uh, do you recall, sir, when you first met Mr. Franklin? Yes, I do. I, I met him in 1775 at the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. I was a 33, 32 years old at the time, and I was the youngest member of the Virginia delegation to the Second Continental Congress, and uh, I had heard of him, of course. Everyone knew of the great Dr. Franklin. He was a, a renowned scientist and philosopher. And he was also a printer whose, whose almanac, poor Richard's almanac, uh, was widely pirated and reprinted throughout uh, the colonies of the New World. So everyone knew of him, but suddenly now in, in the, the autumn of 1775, 
um, as things are really getting very serious between uh, colonial America and the ministry back in Great Britain, I'm called to go up to Philadelphia, and there I meet this extraordinary man. Did you record any of your first impressions of Mr. Franklin, or do you recall any, sir? I was very seldom uh, overwhelmed with awe in the course of my life. Uh, but I felt it with Franklin. As, as I have said, he was 37 years older than I was, so uh, we couldn't be friends in quite the way I could be, say, with John Adams or, or James Madison. He was almost a grandfatherly figure and uh, so eminent that I, that I looked up to him with a deep sense of, of personal humility. I can, I can recall a story, you probably know it, that when I wrote the Declaration of Independence, um, he was on the committee and we turned it into the Congress and Congress then began to debate it on the 2nd of July, 1776. And yeah, I, I recall that was a very uncomfortable thing for you, sir. You are correct. Uh, it was one of the most difficult times of my life that I, I had to sit in the Virginia delegation and listen to the debate. And there was a lively one about every phrase that I had used, the logic of my argumentation, the specific charges that I had leveled against the ministry and, and the crown, um, punctuation even, diction, uh, grammar, um, uh, tone. And you know, nobody likes to be edited, uh, but it was excruciating for me because I was so shy a man. And I also uh, I was very thin-skinned about things of this sort. And, and Dr. Franklin, who was uh, in the room, uh, who never said much in these occasions, never much spoke publicly, he wasn't an orator, he saw me squirming and writhing. And so he, he caught my attention and he told me the story, maybe true, maybe not, of a man named John Thompson, a hatter, who wanted to build a sign for his hat shop in Philadelphia. And so he created a draft and it said, John Thompson Hatter makes and sells hats for ready money. And then under it was a picture of a hat. And that, that was going to be the sign. And he showed it to some of his friends, and they began to edit it. And one of the, I won't tell the whole story. It's, it's quite tedious, actually. But one of them said, well, you don't have to say makes hats because they don't care whether you bought them from a wholesaler or made them yourself. They just want a hat. So you can take makes out. And then another said, well, you can take out for ready money. Everyone knows that you don't have charge accounts. You don't give credit, so of course it's going to be for ready money, so you can remove that. And then another person said, well, John Thompson Hatter makes hats. That's hats twice. Why not just say John Thompson makes hats? And so that was removed. Well, eventually um, it got down to the following. His name, John Thompson, and a picture of a hat. And this was the collective – advice of his friends <laughs> who meddled in his draft. Franklin told this story to me to cheer me up, um, essentially to say, look, this is how it works. Um, of, course it's, of course it's annoying, but it's actually, it's actually an important process. And I think he was, he was trying to distract me because it's not, it's not a very amusing story. And it's, it goes on much longer than I have um, provided for you. So I think he was trying to distract me um, so that I would be less um, uh, anxious and self-conscious at that moment. But, but you know, he had said when, when the Declaration of Independence was first uh, proposed by Congress, he had been offered the chance to write it. And certainly he would have done a spectacular job. But he said that he would never again be willing to write anything subject to committee review. <laughs> and so then when I had committee review, he told this this story, this parable. He was famous for this sort of thing. Sort of young man you should have known better, right? <laughs> but see, but this is how he worked. I could never have said something like that to Madison or Monroe. I wouldn't have told a funny story about a hat or a hat. It's probably a story he made up on the spot. But I would have said, I would have written a letter um, saying, you know, you should understand that no one's draft uh, can stand without uh, the review of other people that a second and third opinion really help and that this is a, a, a budding democracy and therefore the more voices will, that we can produce to, to do this thing will create greater unanimity when the vote comes and so on and so forth. I would have been very straightforward and earnest in such a, a, 
a letter of advice to a young writer, but Franklin had a very different kind of approach. He, he was a raconteur. He told stories. He loved parables. He, he loved parodies uh, and satire. And, and in some ways, he really belongs to the world of Jonathan Swift more than to the world of George Washington. Mr. Franklin was not in terrific health when, when this all occurred, the writing of the Declaration of Independence, sir. But when you finished your first draft, you sent it to him, and in fact, he edited it as well. I mean, he had a background as a, as a pressman, as a printer and a, a writer, and it is said he knew good prose when he saw it. Well, a couple of things about that. First of all, to the immediate question, yes, he did make some suggestions, uh, a number of them, but one of them is of extraordinary importance. I had said, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. And Franklin said, no, no, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Two plus two is four. Um, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Uh, Venus is closer to the sun than Saturn. There are self-evident truths, and our right to revolution is self-evident. And so that was a, a very, what we would then have called a felicitous uh, suggestion, and I took it without any... Uh, chagrin. I would gladly be uh, edited by Dr. Franklin, but perhaps not by some uh, some fellow from South Carolina or, or committee. Or, exactly. Right, so, know. but but here's the interesting thing: you say that Franklin was a gifted pro stylist, and of course he was. But he wasn't that way at the beginning. When he was a young man, as an apprentice to his brother James in in Boston, uh, he began to write some doggerel, some very um, simplistic poetry. And his father said, that, that's not your future. Um, you're not going to be a poet. And, and, and poetry is not really the best path for you in life in, in terms of your advancement and success. So then Franklin began to write some prose, and his prose was not very good. And he realized it. And so here's what he did. And I did the same thing, by the way. He then began to read the essays of, of a, a British team named Addison and Steele, and they had produced a, a, a pamphlet or a series of pamphlets called The Spectator. It was a kind of a periodical. And their prose was extraordinarily smooth and civil and easy to follow and urbane. And Franklin began to try to write in, in their manner. And so he would read one of their essays and then he would put it aside and then he would outline it, the arguments, and he would scramble the outline and leave it for another period of time and come back and try to recreate – the essay in the manner of Addison and Steele. Um, and this taught him. He, he would also imitate other great writers, Daniel Defoe and Jonathan Swift and Alexander Pope. And this taught him style. And he developed his famous prose style in conscious imitation of great models from the Augustan period, the, the 17th and early 18th century period of British literature. And I did precisely the same thing down in Virginia. This was quite common at the time. And that's one reason why people of your age say that the founding fathers were such good writers, because we didn't just learn how to write. We learned how to, to imitate the best models that existed in the ancient world, uh, Cicero and, and, and Livy and Tacitus and so on. And then, of course, the best models in our native tongue in English. With historical figures, larger-than-life figures, such as Benjamin Franklin, we tend to have, uh, well, we sort of condense their lives and remember the most clever or interesting facts. But in reading about Mr. Franklin, what I found very interesting that I don't think a lot of Americans know is just how pro-British he was. Oh, not only pro-British, but he, he was more English than virtually any other of the founding fathers. He and John Adams were, excuse my term, John Bull Englishmen. They were classical Englishmen. And Franklin, when he went to, to Britain in the 1750s, found a home. He, he found a kind of congenial world that he had been longing for all of his life. And he, this was the age of Dr. Johnson and, and Gibbon. Uh, and Edmund Burke and, and Sir Joshua Reynolds and, and Boswell and, and Fanny Burney and, and Goldsmith and the, this whole glittering array of 18th century writers and conversation clubs and taverns and, and, and debate uh, and the pamphlet as a form in the beginning of what you call the magazine. 
uh, and other periodical literature in the great age of newspapers and publication. And when he got there into the British world, he, he, he was more at home than he had ever been, even in Philadelphia, which was the intellectual capital of the new world. And, and I will say this, and I, I know this, this may surprise you, if the British had offered him a significant post in the British ministry, uh, even a post that wouldn't have put him within daily reach of, of the king, Franklin might well have spent the rest of his life in England. And he, he said many times to his friends in England uh, that he would, if he could talk his wife Deborah into it, she was back in Philadelphia and she didn't like travel, didn't was scared of the sea, terrified. He said to his friends as late as 1775 that if he could talk Deborah into going to Britain, that he might spend the rest of his life there because that was where he felt most alive. It's said that he took a, a trip to Scotland looking up, up his ancestors. Well, his ancestors were in the north of England, but he went on to Scotland, which he loved. He actually loved Scotland perhaps even more than England. This was during the Scottish Enlightenment, and David Hume and Adam Smith, he met all of these these fellows. And he said that Scotland would be the place he would choose to live forever, could he? Yes, and, and St. Andrew's University near Edinburgh gave him an honorary doctorate, and that's why we call him Dr. Franklin, that he later got several other honorary doctorates. But, but his first one was from St. Andrew's at a relatively early point in his life, and he felt so honored— uh, by this, that he, he used that name, Dr. Franklin, uh, thereafter. So he sort of had, a, pardon the term, a love affair with Britain, and um, it stimulated him uh, from a standpoint of philosophy and literature. I think it's it's hard for people of your time to realize how important the intellectual environment of of London was. It was the largest city in the in in the world at the time. It had seven hundred fifty thousand people. And something had happened. Uh, the, the, first, the, the Renaissance, uh, followed by the Glorious Rebellion in 1688, and then the rise of the Enlightenment. And all the, this is a kind of a perfect storm of different types of creative and intellectual and political energies that came to Britain and produced this flowering of culture. And he went there, and it was precisely the world that he would have loved to have lived in if he had been born there. But something happened that caused a 180 in Mr. Franklin's feelings about Britain. Could you share that story? Well, two things happened. First of all, of course, the British forced us into rebellion. And so uh, in the end, he realized that he was a, a, a person of the new world and that his primary allegiance had to be to liberty and to the rights of the, the colonies. And so the British, if they had not forced us into rebellion, things have, might have gone very differently for Dr. Franklin. But they also... he. It's a long story, and I won't go into all the details, but he leaked something called the Hutchinson Letters. Hutchinson was an American who had basically betrayed the colonial cause by cozying up to the British ministry and 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 undermining the the effort in in the American colonies to be treated seriously as full British citizens and so on. and had and Hutchinson had had urged harsh measures against the rebels. And so Franklin somehow got a hold of those letters and he shipped them back to Philadelphia where they were leaked to the press and printed. And so he was called in to Westminster to a place called the Cockpit, which is where the Privy Council had some very intense encounters. And he had to stand there for well more than an hour in the cockpit while he was berated uh, by the Solicitor General uh, of of Britain to make a public humiliation of Franklin, partly to disarm him. The, the British knew that he was a potentially very dangerous um, revolutionary if, if he threw his allegiance to the, the colonial cause, but partly because they felt that he was an upstart. And, and, and that's that's what's so lovely about him. He Talk about a natural aristocrat. Franklin grew up in obscurity. In the lower, lower middle class of Boston, his father was a, a soap maker and a candle maker. And, you know, he was an apprentice and he ran away and, and went first to, to New York and then to Philadelphia where he worked ext extremely hard as a young printer. And he rose by the sheer force of his creativity, hard work, genius, thrift – 
and good sense to become one of the most important men who ever lived on earth. My understanding is is that he went into that meeting still hoping for reconciliation between Britain and America, but this uh, public humiliation ended any, any hope of that for him. They drove him into our arms, let's put it that way. Near the end of his life, um, you went to visit him. Can you tell us about that? I had come back uh, from my time in France. As you know, I, I was the American minister to France after Franklin, and people would say, ah, so you, you replace Franklin, do you? To which I always said, no, I succeed him. Nobody could possibly replace him. I said that coming after him as the American minister was a school of humility. So when I came back in 1789, I, I took care of some business at Monticello. I made my way up to New York where I was to become the first secretary of state. I stopped in Philadelphia to see him. He was on his deathbed. And he asked about his friends in France. And I rattled off answers uh, as to, for as many as I could. And I could tell that it was, it was overcharging him. He was becoming too exhausted and too elated, but in a way that couldn't be sustained by this rem- these memories of the people who had been important to him in France. And then I, um, I, I said something about the importance of his autobiography, and he, he, gave, he said, I, here, I'll give you a memento of it. And he gave me one sheet of an unpublished part of his famous autobiography. And I, I took that as an extraordinary act of generosity from this great man. Off of the subject of Franklin, before we end this part of our conversation, Mr. Jefferson, I do have a short letter that I'd like to share with you. Sir. It comes from James and Krista Matson on behalf of their uh, five-year-old daughter, Hayden, who they say they do their, their best to raise as a modern-day Jeffersonian. And at the age of three, Hayden started listening to our conversation, sir. To the Jefferson Hour? Yes, and they say it puts her right to sleep. <laughs> I can't, I'm certain that that must be so. But she's five now and asking thoughtful questions on the topics discussed. And they have a simple request. It, it, it would mean the world to her to hear her favorite president wish Hayden a good night's sleep. Oh, my. Well, I feel um, incapable of, 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 of beating that challenge. But let me say to, to Hayden Matson. I wish her well. I hope she will read all the books that she can find and then ask for more, that she will learn other languages and, and play a musical instrument and, and commit her life to the, to the benefit of all of those around her. And meanwhile, at the end of a long day, whether I have put her to sleep or something else, um, I hope she has a beautiful night's rest. Thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back. You're listening to... The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. It's Clay Jenkinson now. I have doffed my wig and thrown away my buckled shoes. And I'm here in the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn with none other than the semi-permanent guest host of the Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. And proud to be here and pleased to be here, sir. What a great topic, Benjamin Franklin. How could we limit it to just that short conversation? Let's do it again next week out of character because there's so much more to say. That would be great. Let's do that, yeah. So I want to read to you something that that John Adams wrote. Uh, I know you... I know you, you're a little protective of Adams. because <laughs> Only when forced into some that of, position. Some, are, some by... part of you is an Adamsite, but that's fine. <laughs> oh, some, all of us have a little Adams. Uh, yeah. I met an Adamsite on this recent trip to Norfolk. It was great. But, but, but here's this thing. So I have to set it up. So, so please stay with me. Adams um, admired Franklin, of course, but he also was annoyed by Franklin for lots of different reasons. And it's a he kind was, way of putting it. And he was jealous of Franklin's international celebrity. Or as Brand says, uh, Adams was jealous of everyone. <laughs> he was jealous of everyone, of Washington, of Jefferson. But, but he had a special something, antagonism or skepticism, let's call it, towards Franklin. And particularly because Franklin had written Poor Richard's Almanac early to bed and early to rise. And when, when Adams got to... Paris, he said that Franklin wouldn't get up until noon, and then he'd like a, a half an hour later he'd go off in a carriage to some salon where the, they would make much of him, and and he, and Adam said carriage after carriage after carriage would come up in horses <laughs> to Franklin's place at Passy, and you could never get his attention until about eleven o'clock at night, and then he'd say, oh, let's have a glass of port, shall we? <laughs> and so Adam's like, where's poor Richard? Where's where's early to bed and early to rise? So he was onto, you know, he's onto a certain thing that 
was happening to Franken. But for all that, Franken was an international celebrity. He was beloved. And listen to what Adam says of this. You, you can hear the envy and a little snark, but mostly you hear a kind of wonderment. This is a time, David, when the class systems of the world were just like iron, iron. And here's what he said. His name was familiar to government and people, to kings, courtiers, nobility, clergy, and philosophers, as well as plebeians, to such a degree that there was scarcely a peasant or citizen, a valet de chambre, a coachman or footman, a lady's chambermaid, or a scullion in a kitchen who was not familiar with him and who did not consider him as a friend of humankind. When they spoke of him, they seemed to think he was to restore the golden world. Boy, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, what Adams is saying is that the, the most glittering philosophers and salon keepers at the highest levels of French elegance and class and people who were the lowest of the low, kitchen scullions, and he was beloved by all of them across the entire spectrum of civilized French life. When you read that, I, when I read that the other day, I was in a, an inn, <laughs> an inn because there are no motels in New England. I was in an inn. And, <laughs> really? <laughs> and so when I read that, I just burst into tears. I thought, even though you know Franklin was being a little sarcastic here, yeah. it's one of the most beautiful tributes you could possibly imagine, that somebody is beloved at every level of a stratified class-conscious European culture. A couple of things, if I might. Yes, sir. First is that uh, we just recently did a, a little bonus conversation for our 1776 Club, which, by the way, you can find out about at jeffersonhour.com. But you have to join. Well, yeah, the, the website is great. We're extremely proud of it and grateful to our webmaster for putting it all together. You can find out all sorts of information about the shows. You can listen to the shows. You can find Clay's essays there. Uh, we get a lot of requests for people who want to hear them or copy them or share them. And if you go to jeffersonhour.com, you can find all of that. And But we did a, an extended conversation about your – uh, at that time, upcoming trip to Walpole. For, now we'll do another one about what actually happened. Right. There. And then the other thing was that, you know, one of my real pleasures in being able to have these conversations with you and President Jefferson is that you are so liberal with the sharing of your knowledge. <laughs> well, that's, and another thing. And another, you know what Ken Burns says? No, let me Stick finish this. the landing. After our, our extended conversation about you and Ken Burns and – talking about Franklin, I, I texted you and I said, you know, give me a good biography of Franklin to read. And you te immediately responded, said, read The First American, The Life and Times of Benjamin Franklin by H.W. Brands. Uh, it's, a, it's a mammoth book, but boy, what a... This it's a masterpiece. It you really know, he's is. written a lot of books on Ronald Reagan, on Theodore Roosevelt, on, on a whole range of subjects. I think this is his best book. Well, it was a finalist for a Pulitzer. It's better even than his Roosevelt, which is the, called The Last Romantic. But I think, you know, the, when I read it, I was just astonished at how much work H.W. Uh, Brands had to have done to prepare to write this book because it's a big, big life, Franklin. I says. don't know if this is something you want to do as a Jefferson Hour book club entry or not, but because uh, it's it's really— Don't make me read it again. Yeah, no. <laughs> 900 pages. Uh, I actually got to the end of it and thought, you know, I kind of zipped through this— getting ready for the show. I should go back and it's a, and take another week an, and read it's it It's a again. great biography. Another one that I recommend is by Gordon Wood, um, which is called The Americanization of Benjamin Franklin. And it's, it's awfully good too. Anyway, so thank you for that. Let uh, me say this as we're talking about this sort of Ken Burns uh, moment uh, that um, when I was there, um, I've worked, this is my fifth film working with, with the great Ken Burns and it's always such a delight. And I, I mentioned you and he said, please, Give my regards to oh, David Swenson. And, and, you're making and, me and, feel and more important than I should. And he said and remind him of his contributions to his Lewis and Clark. You're making this no, up. No, this is true. Wow. Well, so that how about makes that? My, that makes my day. So it was great. And and I will say this much about it. The whole story will, will be in the 1776 Club debriefing. But it was just magical. He is really extraordinary. And he was on a high. 
because of the huge success of country, country music, music right, which yeah. is getting rave reviews. And, and, and it, it should. It's, it's very, also very brought good. in a demographic. It's a crossover demographic. So lots of people, lots of people who might not want to to really know much more about country music found it fascinating. And lots of people from the the country music world who maybe don't watch all of Ken Burns' films crossed over to watch this Great. and loved it. I really enjoyed it. I was impressed so much by all the archival work his his staff must have had to do to find photographs and uh, clips of old artists. It was great, great, very entertaining. Well, just a, a couple of quick things about that, David. First of all, he, he, he says that his self-description is that he's an archaeologist of emotion. Oh, that's good. Isn't that good? Great storyteller. And, and that's the second thing he says. It's all about stories. And it he is, said, yeah. Everything that's valuable has to be told by way of stories to make it work for a broad audience. And he said, if ever there is a world of stories, yeah, it's country is. music. You know, uh, you, uh, you picked a fine time to leave me Lucille or, you know, help, help me Rhonda. Uh, all these, these, these songs are about the human condition. And even though when you're 20, you may sneer at country music, by the time you're in middle age, you realize that these are actually the stories of betrayal and brother versus brother and the road trip and uh, economic uh, loss and patriotism that these are these are the fundamental stories of life and the country music has a way of getting at them and the third thing he said which i found utterly fascinating is that people who think they don't like country music actually know a lot about it because they've been hearing country songs all of their life and it turns out they're way more culturally literate they're way more culturally literate about country music than they think they are. Well, sir, it is time now to go to this week's essay. Before we do, I just I want to join President Jefferson in wishing Hayden a good night's sleep. A blissful sleep, Hayden, and, and as I like to say at this point, dream higher. <laughs> and with that, sir, it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Thank you, David. A few years ago, in an interview with the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns about Theodore Roosevelt, I said on camera that Roosevelt liked to kill wild animals, that he was, as I perhaps inauspiciously put it, a killer. When you leave a Ken Burns interview, you have no idea uh, what you said will wind up in the film, if anything. Nor do you have any control over the final product, which is an expression of Ken Burns' genius. Although I stand by my statement, which I believe any rational human being would agree with, a few people of the Theodore Roosevelt world were outraged by what I had said. A week ago, I was back in Walpole, New Hampshire, to be interviewed by Mr. Burns for his forthcoming documentary film on Benjamin Franklin. You can have no idea how hard I worked to get ready for that interview. I know a fair amount about Franklin, but I have never before tried to master his life, memorize his quotations, or think... Uh, synthetically, about his life and achievement. In the weeks leading up to my trip to Walpole, I read five or six Franklin biographies, looked up every connection of Franklin to Thomas Jefferson and to John Adams, and wrote out more than 150 pages of all-caps notes on virtually every aspect of his life. Not to get ahead of myself, but the interview went very well indeed, and I believe at least one of my short statements about Franklin will appear in the film. On the other hand, Everything I said could easily wind up on the cutting room floor. But that is not the point I wish to make. When I read the biographies of Franklin, I took special interest in the last weeks of his life in the spring of 1790 because Jefferson, just back from France, stopped to visit Franklin on his deathbed while Jefferson was on his way to New York to take up his duties as America's first Secretary of State. I found what I needed about that last meeting. It's a very moving historical moment. But what I learned not only greatly increased my already high estimation of Benjamin Franklin, but it reduced my respect for Mr. Jefferson. Here's why. Franklin was born in 1706. He was 84 when he died on April 17, 1790. One month before he died, Franklin sent a petition to the new American Congress urging it to do something sooner rather than later about ending the institution of slavery. Nothing came of the petition, but in response, a Georgia representative by the name of James Jackson delivered a vicious denunciation of the anti-slavery position on the floor of Congress. 
He argued that slavery was a positive good. He argued that black Africans were better off on Christian plantations in America than in their native continent. He argued that if we freed black slaves, we'd have to live with them as fellow free citizens, and no respectable person could want that. That's James Jackson. Benjamin Franklin, at death's door, responded by writing the last of his many outstanding parodies. He invented a speech, recently rediscovered, from 100 years previously by one Sidi Muhammad Ibrahim of Algiers. The Islamic leader had been petitioned to release Christian sailors who had been kidnapped by Islamic pirates and were now being used as slaves in the North African Islamic states. Franklin, who was a genius at turning the mirror, simply put all of Congressman Jackson's arguments into the mouth of Sidi Muhammad that Christian sailors were better off in the enlightened world of North African Islam than they would be if they were released, that the sacred scripture endorsed the kidnapping, enslavement, and forced conversion of infidels from the West, that if the Christian slaves were released, many of them would choose to stay in North Africa, and no respectable Muslim could accept that, etc. It was one of Franklin's most brilliant satires, worthy of Jonathan Swift. As with most flip-the-lens experiments, Franklin was able to point out the hypocrisies of the pro-slavery lobby in American life. In our current crisis, just turn the lens. If Barack Obama had paid off a porn star, if Barack Obama had invited Pakistan to investigate Jeb Bush, if Barack Obama had declared that John McCain was not a true hero, you get the point. Franklin's anti-slavery satire didn't change much, but it alters my view of Franklin, who in virtually his last breath attended to the great crime, the great original sin of the American experiment, slavery. He could not let himself die without addressing this fundamental paradox of American life, this stain on such pronouncements as Jefferson's all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What will you speak about in your last hours of life? What are the issues that nag at you, that keep you up at night, that you know we need to address, that you understand as fundamental to the future of our national experiment? So let's review. At the end of his life, George Washington determined to free his slaves, not immediately, but after the death of his wife Martha. When she died in May 1802, 137 Mount Vernon slaves were freed. The president of the United States at that time was Thomas Jefferson, owner of more than 200 slaves at any given moment. Of Washington's gesture, we may think too little, too late, or pretty convenient to do the right thing when you would no longer benefit from an abominable injustice you were quite willing to live with through your whole life. But the plain truth is that Washington did the right thing as we understand the right, and Benjamin Franklin, living on borrowed time, used some of his accumulated prestige and moral capital to urge the Congress of the United States to debate the end of slavery. But what did Thomas Jefferson do at the end of his life? The answer is nothing. He freed a handful of slaves at the time of his death in 1826, all members of the Hemings family. The rest of his slaves were soon sold at auction, families split up, some individuals sold to faraway slave owners they had never met. You can say that Jefferson didn't actually own his slaves by 1826, so he wasn't really in a position to do anything meaningful about an institution he knew was a crime against human right. Fair enough. But of course we know Jefferson lived so far beyond his means all of his adult life that he put himself into the position of having mortgaged his slaves to outside creditors. Insolvency isn't something that just happened to Jefferson like a hailstorm. It was the result of a life of profligate spending on home improvements, books, scientific instruments, wine, and a wide range of gimcracks. What shall we conclude? In my opinion, there is no conclusion but this. At some point fairly early on, Jefferson learned to live with slavery, and the fact that he was one of the more significant slaveholders in the United States, the only one who had written All Men Are Created Equal. So, I expressed my disillusionment with Jefferson as I sat there three feet across from the great and charismatic Ken Burns, and I said it with the passion of deep disappointment. It was the most powerful statement I have ever made about Jefferson and slavery. It came about because of this new reading I'd been doing at an advanced age. We must never stop reading and expanding and raising our consciousness.' 
It was Benjamin Franklin's final act of moral courage when he was operating on a very thin fund of vitality that made me turn my attention back to Jefferson, searching for parallels. And what I saw was complacency and self-interest, not moral courage. I don't know if what I said will get into Ken Burns' film. Probably not, but who knows? I do know this. If my statement winds up in his documentary, I know I will not be chastised by the Jefferson establishment because they are not touchy, not protective of their hero, and not determined to celebrate rather than evaluate one of the most important figures in our history. Jefferson said it best. Of the University of Virginia, he wrote, this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind, for here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.